everyone today. Welcome to Center Point Church. So glad that you made it. Yes, let's celebrate. God is good. If you're new with us, my name is John. I'm lead pastor here, and I'm so glad that you came. And uh, we're sharing in this experience together in God's presence. And uh, this is the third week of a series on Romans chapter 8 called Figure 8. And I want you to get your Bible out, and let's get ready to dive into the scriptures together. And while you're getting the Bible out, uh, so a couple of years ago, uh, a friend gave me a, a, a plant. And it was a, you know, this little plant that I could put on the desk or on my shelf in my office. And it was a, you know, a cute little plant in a little star-shaped uh, tin metal container. And, and I put it there in my office on the shelf and uh, it added some nice green. And, and then it started growing, you know, dangling down the shelf. You could almost imagine it, right? And, and, I, and I had, you know, once a week, a water bottle or something, I'd, I'd water it and it kept growing, dangling a little bit lower. And, and it was just refreshing, you know, look up and see this nice little plant. You can kind of imagine, you can relate, right? You see a nice little plant it kind of feel good. And, uh, and then I can't remember exactly what happened, but um, went on a long trip or something and just kind of got out of the rhythm of watering this little plant. And, um, and, <laughs> and then something like eight, nine months later, I remembered like, oh, that what? Oh, oh, uh oh, <laughs> remember the little plant. And then this is what it looked like after uh, eight months of forgottenness. And, and the poor thing, I mean, I know right now somebody, you're opening up your phone and you're calling PPS on me, Plant Protective Services, because of this plant abuse taking place in this place. But anyway, we, we, uh, we, we can relate, right? A little plant like that, that's not the way it's supposed to look. Uh, but that's what happens, you know, and this, this little plant, you know, it, it's interesting though, I was thinking about it, when I finally did, uh, you know, recognize and the plant that I had forgotten about, uh, I, I was thinking to myself, like, if, if plants could talk, I wouldn't even want to hear what this guy would have to say about me right now. And, uh, and, and if plants could talk, and if I could read the mind of a plant, I wonder if maybe that little plant would have been thinking to itself like, you know what, if I could just keep going, I know that guy's going to be back with that half empty bottle of Dasani he's going to dump on me. I just know, I just know. <laughs> I don't know, but here's what I do know. I know that if you, if you look at this plant, again, like close in on it a little bit, after eight months of no water, it's still pushing out the green at the very end. It was kind of shocking, right? And I wonder if maybe it was because there was this, if, if plants could think, right? This thought in that little plant, like, man, I just know if I could just hold out another week. Next week, he's going to be there. Next week, the water's going to come. And, and what I wanted to share is that as you're opening up the scriptures today, there's something about the future that is like fuel for us. And as you turn into Romans chapter 8, I want, I want you to embrace this idea that there, there's something about the future possibility for good that fuels us to keep fighting for what we need to fight through right where we are now. And, and I think about it like this. For example, the good people over in the Ukraine right now, uh, I, I wonder if maybe it is the thought that uh, maybe three or four weeks from now, this nightmare is somehow going to be over that's allowing some of those people to, to keep on fighting and to keep on holding on, right? I wonder if maybe if you could think about it like this, if, if a woman eight months pregnant in July in Murrieta and it's 117 degrees and she's carrying this child, I wonder if maybe it's the, the future thought of, yeah, but in a few short weeks, I'm going to be holding my, this precious one, right? It allows her to keep going. Or, or like a kid who's uh, dealing with finals during finals week and he's bleary eyed and, and he hasn't even gotten any sleep and he's taking test after test. And, but maybe it's just the thought of like Friday afternoon freedom when finals week is done. It allows them to keep going. You know what I'm talking about? And, and, and that is to me, it speaks of the reality that the future becomes like fuel for us when, when we can embrace that there is a future hope for good that we're moving towards. And so I, I, want, I want to just turn to the scriptures right now and we're going to make our way to Romans 8. And in the first week of this series, we began with this simple understanding from Scripture that uh, we can be set free from sin and live uh, with a spirit-led mindset. 
That was the first part. And I hope you'd listen to that message if you had another chance, or at least read the beginning of Romans. We can live with a spirit-led mindset. And that is the first key to, to living in, in victory. And then last week, the second week of this series, we came to embrace that it's not only that I can live with a spirit-led mindset, it's also that I am a spirit-led, loved child of God. And that's where we were last week. And at, at the end of the message last week, we, we, we read the last part of verse 17 where it talked about the fact that you and I are heirs, heirs, spiritual inheritors, heirs together with Christ. And, and so I want to rest there for a second before we jump into the scripture. The, the Bible said that you and I, if we've ever put our trust in Jesus, we are heirs, heirs. Everybody say heirs. We are heirs. And, and that, that means something. An heir is a person who has a standing of authority in a family. An heir is a person who has a, a, a relationship that's determined in the family that gives value. An heir is a person with certain rights and privileges just because of that standing in the family. But an heir is also somebody who is looking forward to a moment when they will inherit the full measure of what is rightfully to be theirs because of that standing in the family. You with me? Yeah. All right. Don't everybody sound so enthusiastic all at the same time. It's kind of overwhelming, right? <laughs> I'll ask one more time. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That sounded like Centerpoint Church came to worship. So Romans 8, jump in with me at verse 17 and following. It says, and since... We are his children. We are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. And yet, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. You know, when you read the Bible, if you were to just start reading the Bible from cover to cover, what you would notice uh, on broad brushstrokes is a lot of tension. There's a lot of tension in the Bible. There's tension right from the very beginning. Like, will they do what God said or will they just do their own thing? There's tension between the different groups that are mentioned even in the beginning of the Bible after the flood. There's tension between what God's law says that his people should do and then what they actually start doing. There's tension between what God's people want for their lives and what they're actually experiencing. And there's there's tension through into the New Testament. We, we looked at the tension in, in the beginning of the book of Romans, tension between the spirit and the flesh. And I'm hoping that we're gaining an appreciation for the tension in the scripture. And the beginning of Romans showed us we can live with victory in that tension. And we can live with victory even in the tension between the spirit and the flesh to whatever degree we would follow the leading of the spirit. And I want to embrace that tension, but here is a different tension. And it's a tension between how things are currently and how we really wish and hope they might be. And that tension is something that probably a lot of us have a good deal of experience in. Some of us, maybe even right now, we could say, wait, say that again? Tension between how things are right now and how I really wish they would be. And, and in that tension, there's an opportunity. And, and there's an opportunity to, to, to maybe live a different kind of a way. And, and I want to just go back to verse 18 and say that phrase that we just heard again, and I want you to, to hear it. It says, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Why don't you read it with me? Say it. Go. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Do you see the tension? There's a, there's a later, there's a future state that's preferred, that's good, that's out there and awesome and positive, but then there's a reality right here, which it's just not that. Whatever it is, it's not fully that. And so there's this now, there's this later, and here we are right in the middle of it. Now and later. Now and laters. Remember those? Now and laters. Remember those? 
I remember being a kid uh, and, and loving the now and laters. Like, because yeah, you'd get one package, but it have like six or seven, and so there's lots of goodness. But the thing is about a now and later, when you really think about it, think about this. Anyone my age or older, maybe you can relate. You put a now and later into your mouth, what do you actually experience? Pain. Pain on the roof of your mouth. These square little pointy edges are like pointing into the soft palate of the roof of your mouth, and it hurts. And now and later, it was a lie, at least in its initial experience. But as a kid, you know, I'd put a now and later in my mouth, and I would put up with the pointy, rough edges of the corner of the now and later because I just knew that, that, that later <laughs> it would melt away to some ooey, sugary, sweetness, goodness, right? And, and, and so you dealt with the, the rough edges of that, uh, of that now for the sake of what would come later. And, and I guess it's maybe not a stretch to say I think that maybe God is calling us to a, a, bit, of a, a bit of an embracing of the tension, but at a, at a deeper level, and to focus on the future to be able to persevere in the present. That's an axiomatic truth. You focus on the future to persevere through the present. Let me take it a step deeper in light of the scripture that we just read and we'll be reading to, to, uh, today. And it's this statement that frames this message. And it's, I persevere by the focus on the future. I focus on the future glory to be able to persevere through the present grind. I want you to just say this statement. Just try it on for size for a second. Just say it with me. I focus on the future glory so I can persevere in the present grind. Anybody got a present grind? Anybody got a present grind? You know, the reality is I, I'm using the word grind, and it, it, I'm using it obviously because I like alliteration and glory and grind just goes, right? So, but grind is, is my stand-in word for the word that we just read in the scriptures, which is uh, Suffering. Suffering. Anybody wake up today going, oh, man, I just hope we get to hear about suffering today in church. Anybody? No? Well, we're going there anyway. So <laughs> brace yourselves. Suffering. And in verse 18, that word is just right there, not sugar-coated, just there. And one of the things I thank God for is that in his word, there is no sugar-coating about the reality of human suffering. That God didn't ever want for any of us to be deluded into thinking that it was all going to just be a cakewalk and nothing but sunshine and roses for the rest of our lives because we're following Jesus. In fact, what you, what you realize is that Jesus, my Savior, your Savior, Jesus that you say you're following, he said, hey, 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 let me let you know something, John 16, 33. In this world, you will have trouble. Put that on a bumper sticker crochet that into a, a knitting and put it on your family room wall. <laughs> That's not a promise verse I've seen in anybody's house any time recently, by the way. But it is a declaration that Jesus made. Jesus was making a declaration about reality, a matter-of-fact declaration. In this world, you will have trouble. Don't be surprised by it. Don't be shocked when it happens to you. Don't act as though something crazy and unimaginable were already, are suddenly taking place. Jesus said, this is part of the nature of this, this world that you are living in. In this world, you will have trouble. L let me take you back to Romans 8, 18 one more time. Say it with me again, loud and strong. Go. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Jesus said there would be suffering. The Spirit of God through Paul here in Romans is saying the suffering now, it, it, it is real. And I want you to just think about it for, for a moment. There is no exemption for any of us to what the Bible is talking about here about suffering. No exemptions. And no matter how good you might be, no matter how bad you might be, no matter how friendly you are, no matter how many Bible studies you come to or don't, this is a reality of the human story. Ever since the days of the Garden of Eden through to the present moment, suffering is part of the human experience. What are you going to do with it? Suffering, generally speaking, comes from three sources. Number one, our own bad choices. Sometimes we suffer because we, 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 we did dumb something. Sometimes we, we experience suffering and it's because of someone else's bad choice. That's a reality. 
many of us have experienced. And then a third place that suffering originates from is the fallenness of this world as a result of the curse because of what happened in the Garden of Eden and all of the things that come from that. Sickness, disease, and darkness and evil. Those three sources are where evil, uh, sorry, where suffering comes from. And there's no exemption. There's no, uh, let me get a hall pass on that, please. <laughs> it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a part of our reality. The only question is what kind of suffering might we deal with and what degree of suffering might we deal with. Suffering's going to come to some degree into every human story just as surely as rain is going to fall in any garden that's actually going to grow. And so I, I want to just not be shocked. Instead, I want to know, well, what do I do with it? When I begin to experience suffering of one kind or another, what do I do with it? Do I let it grind me down and to become bitter and hopeless? Do I let it grind me down to despair where I give up? Do I let it throw me back to where I just throw in the towel and, and give up on life? I don't think so. What I, what I want to see in the scripture is an opportunity to, to do something different. And that is to embrace a future hope. That's what we read in Romans 8. In verse 18, that there is a, a glory that is coming in the future. And, and that glory, it, it will eclipse the weight of the suffering. I believe that. I want to invite you to stand with me in believing it because it's part of what we see in the scriptures, in the word of God. Suffering does something, though. I, I want to acknowledge this. Suffering does something. Think about the Apostle Paul for a moment. The Apostle Paul wrote most of the New Testament inspired by the Holy Spirit. And yet Paul, apparently the health and wealth gospel didn't apply to him because he got a whole uh, crap ton, if I can say that, of suffering. He, I mean, shipwrecks and sicknesses and snake bites and imprisonments and beatings and public floggings and embarrassment and trials in front of uh, tribunals and judges and being hauled around in captivity and chains and personal thorn in the flesh sickness. I mean, that man of God dealt with it, a lot of it, and I see that that's the one who wrote these words inspired by the Spirit. And what he also said, Paul also said, that suffering does something. More than you can probably see when you're going through the middle of it, but it does something. Paul, the one we just talked about, wrote these words in 2 Corinthians 4. He said, therefore, 2 Corinthians 4, 16, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, Yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And it's sometimes the hardest thing you and I will ever learn to do is in the middle of a moment where all I see is this diagnosis and this treatment protocol and that surgery and that uh, difficulty with that person and this business falling apart and this stack of debt mounted up against me and, and this uh, enemy coming at me and all of whatever kind of suffering we might endure. One of the most challenging things to do is to learn the spiritual art of looking past the immediacy of what we see into the unseen realm. But that's where the glory is. That's where the glory is. When the scripture talks about a future glory, th there, there is a reality that you and I need to be aware of. I mean, Paul talked about it this way. He said, outwardly, we are wasting away. That, that's poetic language. But I'll tell you what. I, I remember when I was like, I don't know, 21, 22. Dude, I was invincible. <laughs> Drop me anywhere. I'll bounce, right? Anybody remember the invincibility of the 20s? And some of you are still there. God bless you. The Bible says the glory of a young man is their strength, and the, and the, and the grace of an old man is his gray beard, whatever that means. But I, I'm not in that, that golden zone. I, I read these words, outwardly we are wasting away, and something inside me goes, mm-hmm. 
And, and for all of us, really, I mean, this is the truth. There's an outward wasting away. I mean, I, I think I read w- one study that said, yep, uh, you're never going to be as statistically as healthy, a- any healthier than you were at age 43. Like some statistician said, that's it. <laughs> it's all downhill from there. <laughs> but the Bible said, outwardly, we're wasting away. And for many of us, I mean, even just the regular old wear and tear of being a human being on planet Earth, we can relate to that. Like, yeah, yeah, things are a little bit rougher now, right? So, but, but add on top of that, some of us got you know, into some tragic accident and it messed up our body, or others of us uh, you know, caught some kind of a crazy illness and struggled with that. Others of us had a birth defect or a genetic disorder that leaves us fighting in our physical bodies, and that wasting away feels like it had somebody put an accelerator on it. And so this inspired word is, yeah, it's part of this reality. Outwardly, we're wasting away. And the eventuality of death comes with a startling rate of predictability. One out of one, people die. And for most, that includes some degradation and suffering along the way. There's only three people that, you, that didn't die. Elijah, Enoch, and Jesus. And for the rest of us, there, there's a natural progression that there's an outward wasting away. And a lot of that includes suffering. And, and we, can't, we can't sugarcoat it. And we can't just close our eyes and stick our head in the ground and go, no, 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 no. Instead, I, I want to take note of what the Holy Spirit through Paul inspired in these words, where it said, yeah, though outwardly we're wasting away, uh, yet inwardly, inward, inwardly, inwardly in in a place deep within me that you can't see, that a doctor doesn't know how to diagnose. Inwardly, I'm being renewed. Inwardly, my spirit is even fresher and younger than 21 or 43 or whoever else would say whatever. I'm being renewed. I am taken back to the fountain of strength and power and capacity inward in my spirit. I'm being renewed day by day. And don't miss this. And our light and momentary troubles, verse 17 said, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Your suffering is doing something. And and I, I I I don't want suffering. But if I have to go through it, I want to at least get whatever I can out of it and recognize that God said that it it would be doing something. If God, through Paul, said, your suffering is achieving for you an eternal weight of glory, wouldn't it be better to say, all right, fine, I don't want this stupid trial, struggle, disease, sickness, problem. I don't want it. But God, if you said you're going to do something through it, then do it all. Do it all. Do it as deep as you want. Renew me to the depths of my innermost being, God, through this dumb, hard trial. Your your trouble is achieving something for you that goes beyond the visible and the seen. I'll I'll share with you four things that I personally feel like my suffering, and I won't bore you with all the details of my own, but I've got plenty of it, that four, four, to start with, four things that my suffering does for me. I think it does it for you, too. First of all, my suffering, number one, makes me aware of my total dependence on God. When everything is perfect and happy, I almost kind of am sailing through like, yeah, thumbs up, big guy, God, but I'm good. I got it made. I can do it all. And all of a sudden, my suffering forces me into an utter awareness of my total dependence on God. And that deepens my, my spirit, takes me beyond the shallows, puts a depth and power into my faith that I don't know that I would really have another way. And number two, my suffering draws out gratitude for what's good. Here's what I mean. When you're suffering, you begin to see so much of the pain and so much of the struggle, and you kind of get a sense, if that's all I focus on, I'm going to drown in it. And so you begin to develop a discipline of going, yep, this suffering is still here, the disease, the problem with the, those people. And the, so I'm going to deliberately discipline myself to look at the things that are good. Yep, that's still there, but this is good. 
and this is good too, and God, thank you for that, and God also, thank you for this. And what that does is it shifts the focus onto the goodness and glory of God rather than the pain of the struggle that I happen to be walking through, which God's word said is momentary. It is momentary. You're, you're, and I, there are days when I go, why'd you call it light? It's not light, this is heavy. I'm going in for a stinking spinal cord surgery. God, it's not light. But yet, his word says, yeah, but in the vast scheme of things, your light and momentary troubles are achieving for you a weight of glory that will eclipse them. That, number three, my suffering creates a greater capacity for empathy in me. My suffering creates a greater capacity uh, for empathy within me. Outside of and before and without the suffering, somebody talks to me about how hard the thing is that they're dealing with, and I, and I go, uh, <laughs> yeah, I feel your pain, bro. I feel your pain, bro. But after a bunch of suffering, no, no, really. No, really, I feel your pain, bro. <laughs> I feel it. <laughs> the suffering that I am enduring takes me to a place where there's solidarity for the suffering of another so that I can go beneath the surface level sympathy. And, and, and that is needed in the world. How else am I going to get there? And then number four, what my suffering does for me is my suffering gives me an eager anticipation of heaven. My suffering gives me an eager anticipation of heaven. And there's a lot of goodness in this world. There's a lot of pleasures in this world. There's a lot of wonderful things in this world. But I want to keep in view and allow to be in my view the glory of heaven, the future glory of heaven. This is, this is part of the reality that my God is drawing me to. I, I can... I can persevere now with that in view. I focus on the future glory so I can persevere through the present grind. But that future glory, let's talk about that future glory for a second. OK, the future glory. Future glory may be a moment in my lifetime out there in front of me, maybe a year out, maybe a decade out, who knows, but where the blessing of God breaks through and miracles start breaking out. And I'm always going to pray for that. And I'm always going to believe for that. And I can point to a litany of moments in my life where that's exactly what happened. And that's a kind of future glory. And I'm going to let my view go beyond the immediacy of right now and its struggles and at least see to that with eyes of faith. But you know what? I think that my God in Romans 8 has something even further in view than that. And that there's a future glory, a future glory that goes beyond the confines of this time, space, continuum, as I currently am familiar with it. It's infinite. It, it, it's eternal. And this is what you and I get to have in view. It, it's a future glory of heaven itself. And, and I, wa I want to em embrace that. I want to. Romans 8, 19, let me keep reading. In Romans 8, 19, it says, for all creation is waiting eager eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. All creation has some kind of an experience of suffering. When, when we read this part of Romans, by mention of the curse from the Garden of Eden, we're taken back to the very beginning where the freedom given to humanity was exercised in such a way that it led to the fallenness of humanity. But that fallenness didn't just affect human beings, it affected the whole created order. And that's what's being revealed here. And, and yes, we can spend some time in the mountains and go, ah, the blue sky, winter sport blue with one cloud and it's 79 degrees. This is perfect, but it's not. 
It's, it's not. Even in the created order, God is saying, even in the creation, it's crying out because of a weight of suffering. You don't need to look any further than tornadoes and wildfires and earthquakes and hurricanes and tsunamis and, and, and pathogenic diseases. And, and you can begin to see, oh, yeah, even in the creation, there's suffering. And, and God's word is saying, yeah, and even creation is looking forward to something. Like, yeah, if plants could talk, if mountains could speak, if deserts could say something, there would be a yearning that would be heard for the glory of God that is yet to be revealed. There is a future glory we are meant to be fixing our eyes on. And sometimes the hard things that we do go through force the issue. And the issue needs to be forced because we could too easily just settle for, yeah, everything's good. I love it. Right now it's good. Everything's great. Eh, who cares about heaven schmevin? <laughs> and I think a lot of us as believers, sometimes we, I mean, we, it's an afterthought at best. And every once in a while, God goes, hey, I actually paid a really high price for it for you. So I'd like you to actually think about it. I'd like you to actually anticipate how good it's going to be. <laughs> There's a future glory that's coming. Let, let me ask you this question just to see how this works for us. Like this summer, uh, who is looking forward to this summer, just generally speaking? Just show hands, anybody looking forward to the summer? And you know what? If we were, to, we were to start asking around the room, it would be like, well, because we're planning a family reunion, and others, hey, we, because we just booked our tickets, we're going to wherever, and someone else would say, yeah, because, you know, we're, we, we can't, we're not doing a big trip, but we got 10 beach days throughout the summer. I can't wait. Someone else, you just reserved your park, your camping uh, spot, and, and you can't wait for it. And, and others of you, you're just looking forward to the heat. Somebody's just like, I just want it to heat up a little bit. And, and not when it's 117. You won't be hoping for that as much anymore. But anyway, you, you think about what's ahead, and it causes right now to feel a little different. It just has that effect. Even me just rattling off some imaginary ideas got some of us going, ah, oh, yeah. There's something so powerful about the positive possible future that fuels us for right now's fight. And it should. You know what? I want to just share this also. Um, Ann and I, speaking of looking forward to the summer, uh, we are blessed with the opportunity this summer to take a sabbatical. Our board, just our center point board, just made a decision this week to uh, pr approve that for Ann and I to be able to take a extended little break. I want to just share about this for a second. I'm excited about it. it, it it's not just hey, you get a, 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 an extra week off. It's no, you, you're going to get a couple of months to take a, an extended leave of absence to sharpen the axe <laughs> for cutting for years to come after that fact. And I'm, I'm believe you me, like I, I'm thinking about the summer with like such an anticipation. Like oh man, I, I get to go there and learn from that mentor. I get time to go and and, and uh, be in prayer at this one uh, this one chapel I've always wanted to visit. I get to have some time to write a book that I just need to get out of my heart. Like there's all of that goodness, but I'm here right now. But just even the thought about that causes me to go, oh, I'm, I'm think, I think about it things a little differently. I carry the weight a little bit differently. It just has that effect. And, and for you and I, God is beckoning us through Romans 8, 18 and following in particular, saying, hey, can I get your attention, please? I purchased something for you. And I know what you're going through right now is hard. But I want you to just let this catch your attention for a second. I've purchased something for you. It's going to be amazing. Trust me. It's going to be even better than anything you've imagined, and it's going to be so good that you won't even remember the challenge of what was. This is, this is what I'm reading here. I just, I just want to embrace it. Romans 8.23, though, let me keep going. Romans 8.23, it said, And we believers also groan. Even though, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. Whew. Yeah, we too, we wait with eager hope for the day when 
God will give us full rights as adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. New bodies. New bodies. <laughs> what a hope. New bodies. What a great hope. What, what, a, what a great hope this is. Because our bodies are where we feel so much of the suffering. Or the body of somebody that we love and their pain becomes ours as we watch them struggle. And so in, in the middle of that, God says, yep, and I want you to know, I have a promise for you. And it's, it's of, of a new body. So let me just share this with you. You know, over the last 10 years, I've prayed for a lot of people for healing. Because we follow Jesus. And Jesus laid hands on the sick, and they were healed. And if we're going to follow Jesus, we're going to go, well, I think we're going to try that. <laughs> and we do. And we pray for the sick. And there have been thousands of people in this church touched by the healing power of God. Hundreds of times where me personally, I, I, in, ten, in the last 10 years, hundreds that I have personally laid hands on or without even laying a hand, but declaring the work of God over and a physical supernatural healing has taken place. And we believe for that. And we're always gonna believe for that because Jesus, <laughs> because Jesus, that's an, a, a, a moment where you can give the because Jesus answer. And, and you know what's crazy? In the last 10 years, laid hands on so many people, I've seen hundreds of people supernaturally healed and yet, during that same 10 years, seven times, I've had to go into the hospital to get a surgery to get tumors out of my body. Painful every time. Difficult every time. Radiation treatment for six weeks. Like, horrible. Can you explain this to me? I, actually, please don't. Because if you tried, you'd probably start to bludgeon me with garbage like, well, you just don't have enough faith, or there's just hidden sin in your life, or you just, uh, you said that you were sick out loud, and that empowered the devil, so you this stuff is garbage. I'm sorry, I, and I believe fully in the healing power of Jesus, but, but we will not have an atmosphere in this church where we shame somebody for not having been healed. We just will not do that. I will not allow that. We will contend for healing, and we will celebrate when anyone has a breakthrough of physical healing in their body. We will celebrate it. But you know what else we'll celebrate? We will celebrate it when a brother or sister didn't get their healing, but they kept rising up day after day with faith in their heavenly Father despite the struggle, because that's just as much a miracle. I would even tell you, I mean, I would even tell you it takes maybe more faith to soldier on decade after decade dealing with this condition that just won't change no matter how many hundreds of holy, amazing people have laid hands on you. It takes even more faith to keep soldiering on saying, yeah, but God, I love you and trust you anyway. That is a gift of God when it happens. We'll celebrate that too. We, we, we have to embrace the both, the both. And, and as much as you know, people tend to want to swing, it's got to either be only this or it's got to be either only that. We're going to go, no, there's just tension. There's tension. And yes, you might quote to me like, Jesus, everyone they brought to Jesus was healed. No, well, except for the place where he went in his own hometown. And he said he could only hear, heal a few people there. So don't, don't, don't throw that thing at me. Because there are episodes, even when Jesus, there, I'm sure there were more sick people in, in Nazareth than that. I, I want to embrace God's word. I want to go for it and believe. But I also want to believe and claim Romans 8.23. I, I, I'm going to get healed. It's only a matter of time. I'm going to be healed. You who are struggling, you're going to be healed. It's only a matter of time. And that healing may come in next week or in next month or in next year or in the next decade. It might come by a supernatural lightning from heaven, touch of God. It might come through a, 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 a surgical procedure. It might come, but it also might come when I cross the line into the timeless goodness of God and receive the new body he's promised to me. And I'm holding on to it. I claim that too. Romans 8.23, but I got to keep reading. Verse 24 says, we were given this hope 
when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. And, and the hope that the scripture is speaking about is a future glory that goes beyond the here and now, and it is heaven. That is what Romans 8 is driving at. Yes, we get the power of God to live in all kinds of adventure and fun and victory here on planet Earth, but this world is not your forever home. It, you, you have a, a citizenship in heaven, Philippians 3 tells you, and that you get a different, a new body when you step into that reality. And so God is here saying, would you embrace what I've paid for for you? It's actually pretty darn amazing. I, a, a friend a while back blessed Ann and I with something amazing. Uh, and this friend said, hey, we, uh, we, got, we got you a, a VIP tour of Disneyland and dinner at Club 33. I mean, if you're a Disney person, you know. I just throw, threw down the pearls and the gold and the, all of I mean, it, there's nothing better. No, I mean, there is nothing better than that. Like a behind-the-scenes private VIP tour of Disneyland and dinner at Club 33, amazing. And, you know, you, it, the cost of that, I don't even want to mention out loud. It was such a blessing to us. But, but listen, could, could you imagine if uh, this friend let, let, let us know about this, uh, you know, wonderful blessing and then checked in with us to say, hey, so uh, that's the date. Are you looking forward to it? And what if my answer was, meh, I mean, it's probably going to be okay, I guess. But I'm really excited about this gas station hot dog I'm having right now. It's really good. <laughs> right? I mean, how bizarre, right? How bizarre when such an untold awesome blessing w was paid for for me and, and provided for, for me. Like, and, and the better response is, I have been thinking about that every day. Like, I can't wait. I know it's months out, and, but it's going to be a memory to last a lifetime. And I can't wait. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I've been reading the menu online about what I could eat at Club 33. Like, I, yes, I'm excited, you know. I mean, I've still got to go to work. I've still got to do my thing. Got to still deal with the whatever of reality in, in the present. But, but man, I got a VIP tour at Disneyland, Club 33 out in front of me. And, and it's meant to be that, that blessing of, of what lies ahead. And this is what we see in the scriptures regarding heaven. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it, it said, this is what the scriptures mean when they say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And Jesus is the one who said, I'm leaving the, the time and space continuum as you know it because I'm going to prepare a place for you. I know you think this is where it's all at, but actually... I'm doing something over here that's going to be amazing, and I want you to know about it. It's not a secret, and I do want it to motivate you to be able to keep plowing through whatever you got to keep plowing through, and it is that, that focus on the future that fuels me to persevere in the present Jesus said, I'm preparing this place for you. And then Revelation 7, 17 gives a layer of nuance to what it's going to be like, this reality of the future glory of heaven. Revelation 7, 17, it talks about Jesus as the Lamb of God who's seated on the throne. And Revelation 7, 17 is as the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is your future glory. It matters. Every single one of us, one day we will step into it. And God is saying, I want you to begin, though, to imagine it now. And if you, if you can receive this, begin to experience it now. Be lifted beyond the confines of this moment into an eternal experience of the throne room of God. Hebrews 4.16 has said, you're welcome here. Heaven itself. Bust on in. Go boldly. Because there you will find the grace and help in your time of need in the middle of the struggle. So believer, believe for this. All of it. Don't leave out the best which is saved for last. 
for you, the future glory. Believer, let God get hold of you with a view of this eternal goodness called heaven. He paid a great price so that you could have admission to that place, to that reality. Don't devalue the price he paid by minimizing the worth of heaven just because you're caught up with right here, right now. Both. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you allowed us in your word to catch a glimpse of of your heart for us. Thank you that, God, part of your heart for us is an acknowledgement of how hard things are, and you use the word suffering. Thank you for that, God. Thank you for that, God. It's freeing that you said, yeah, it's suffering, yep, and that you didn't candy coat it or tell me I should just buck up But you use the word suffering. You acknowledge the pain that so many of us deal with. Thank you, Father. And thank you, Lord, that in your word, you you also show us the way to make it through the, the, the stuff that's so difficult. And so, God, I pray for a release right now into every single one of my friends sitting here, a release, God, of a supernatural capacity to quick get lifted to a vantage point where we can see so far ahead that we're catching a glimpse of heaven itself. I ask for a supernatural release of that to every single one of my brothers and sisters here right now. That, and, and that in that, we would be able to feel a strength coming into us for whatever is right now because we've got a view of what will be one day. We embrace the tension, and we believe, God, for your goodness to be revealed. So, God, I pray for a future hope kind of a mindset to be released into every single one of us. Every one of us would be burst out of time-bounded shackles and into an eternal experience, viewing where you're taking us, the long game, the big picture. And God, at the same time, I do want to pray for healing, for healing, for here and now. I believe it's both. I'm I'm good with your both, God. (laughs) So I pray for a release of faith even to believe you for both the future glory and the faith breakthrough now, all of it. God, I pray for that. that power of your spirit to move among us right now. And while we're praying together, listen, for somebody, I just need you to hear this. Like God is is allowing you to hear about heaven today because he wants you to be able to go there too. And being one who's welcomed forever into heaven isn't about have you been good enough? Did you go to enough Bible studies? Did you say enough religious words? Did you prove to those people at church that you finally got your act together? It has nothing to do with any of that. It has to do with whether you would just simply say, Jesus, 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 save me. (laughs) That's that's where it all begins. And so maybe for somebody right now, what you need to do is simply say, Jesus, would you save me? Forgive my sin and save my life. I mean, otherwise, you're left stuck carrying your sin around and feeling the guilt of it, and, and then without having a hope for heaven because heaven's perfect and sin isn't welcomed there. And therefore, one who's not forgiven and cleansed ain't gonna have a place there. But God's desire is that you would wake up spiritually and say, yes, Jesus, forgive my sin and save me. And he will, right here and right now. So God, I pray for that awakening to happen. While we're praying together, if you're sitting here going, well, I want that. I want to ask Jesus to forgive my sin and save my life. I don't want to carry it around. And I certainly don't want to carry it across the line into eternity. I pray, God, you'd do an awakening right now. If you want to ask Jesus to forgive your sin and save your life, then right now I want you to raise your hand. Right now, raise your hand with me as a way of finally saying, I want to ask Jesus to forgive me and save me. And raise it high. I want to make sure I can see you. Way up in the back, in the middle. Thank you. Anyone else in the middle uh, on the floor here on my right? Anyone else? I don't want to miss you. In my left over here in the middle, thank you. Anyone else on, on the far right? A couple of you. And the, and the right side in the back, I see you, man. That's great. And if there's anyone else on the left over here in the middle, I see you, man. That's great. If you're joining me online, you just type into the comments, I, I want to say yes to Jesus. And right now, those of you who have raised your hand, I want you to pray with me. And, and, if, and I see you. That's great. I want you to pray with me. And you say, Jesus Christ, 
I believe in you. I mean, just say those words with me. Jesus Christ, I believe in you. Say it again. Jesus Christ, I believe in you. I repent of my sin. I turn away from it. And I turn to you, Jesus. Would you forgive me, Jesus? And just ask him, would you forgive me, Jesus? Would you forgive me, Jesus? His answer from all eternity is, yes, done and done. Look at the cross. He's pronounced it already. You're forgiven. And, and would you just say to him, Jesus Christ, I'm yours. I'm yours. Just say it to him, Jesus Christ, I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm yours. Take charge. Help. Help. Rescue. Heal. Set me free, Jesus. Just say it to him, Jesus, I believe that you conquered death and you're alive. You say it to him, Jesus, I believe you conquered death and you're alive. So come into my life. Be Lord forevermore. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. While we're uh, praying together, our ministry team is trying to find those of you who raised your hand. We'd just like to give a Bible to you and help you get connected so you will grow in this relationship. I want you all to stand up together. And as we're standing together, some of us need God's touch in our physical bodies. And we embrace the hope of a renewed body in heaven, but we also all contend for God's touch in the here and now too. Both end. And for some of you, what you need to do, if that's you, you need to come up at the end to the front. Our prayer team's going to be right up here. We're going to lay hands on you. And some of you are going to receive a healing. Father, thank you for your presence and your goodness. Thank you for the promises of your word. We praise you, Father. We praise you, Father. And all our hope is in you. All our hope is in you. I will rest in your promises, my confidence is your faithfulness, is your faithfulness. Sing that out. Thanks again for joining us today. I hope the message encouraged you as much as it encouraged me. We'd love for you to be a part of the life of Centerpoint Church. And one of the ways to do that is by going to our website, mycenterpoint.tv. Also, if you like to invest and give towards what God's doing, there's ways to do that at our website. We'd love for you to subscribe. Thanks again. God bless and have a great day.